This is part two of our ice machine conversation. So in the last one, we talked about the basic sequence of being the ice machine, the sequence of operation in terms of fill, harvest, waste, um, freeze cycles. We talked about that there is no defrost cycle in an ice machine. That is called harvest because we're actually, the defrost is what actually gets the product off the evaporator. We also talked about that there is no cooling cycle. It's called a freeze cycle. So all ice machines are rated in pounds per hour per day. We've already talked about that production varies based on inlet water temperature and ambient air temperatures. We have over 30 manufacturers of ice machines and each one has their unique features. Each manufacturer produces either cubes, flakes, or nuggets as terms of the ice type. We might have small squares, that's by isomatic. We might have the shot glass type, that's by Scotsman. We might have buttons, that's the form of the ice cubes, look like a button, that's by crystal tips. We might have diamond looking, that's by Ross Temp. Large squares are Whirlpool. Diced would be Manitowic. Tube ice looks like little pieces of tubes, that's Voss. And we have nuggets that's by various different manufacturers. The main selling points of ice machines is the purity and the clarity of the ice. This is an example of tube ice. If you look at the picture closely, it looks like it's cut pieces of little tubes. Flaked ice is another manufacturer. Okay, we take ice and we flake it. So that's used like in snow cones. Nugget ice is by far the most popular. This is what you see in a lot of the hotels, a lot of the bars, and a lot of the restaurants. It's little nuggets. But whatever it is, okay, we have to have clarity and purity of the ice. Flaker type ice is a little bit of a different process. We have our evaporator walls, which is the refrigerated cylinder. If you look at the arrow, we feed water in in the bottom and there's an auger that is constantly running and as the water freezes on the walls, it flakes that ice off and shoves it down a chute into the bin. This auger has to be perfectly aligned or it will actually destroy the evaporator. The main points of failure in these auger machines are the gears at the top and the bearings at the top and bottom. Okay, once those are done, the ice machine needs to be replaced. So if you take a look at the evaporator of any ice machine, okay, this is a cutaway section. The, over, the oval tubing in the center has a great heat transfer because it has good surface area across the evaporator plates, which are on the outside. So our refrigerant goes through the center of this tubing, Okay, removes heat from the plates, brings the heat plates down to between 10 and 20 degrees. The water flows down on the outside of this and starts freezing to the plates. There's patterns on these plates depending on how we want the ice to look. Okay, and then the water will continue to flow as the machine goes into harvest mode. And uh, once the hot gas hits that machine, it, that ice, it breaks loose from the evaporator and falls off and is strained out of the water. Okay, this again, if we take a look at the water circuit for a cube machine, your evaporator plates are vertical. You'll see that they have little cubes built into the evaporator plating. Okay, here's an ice that's formed on it. Okay. So the water flows up through the reservoir, through the pump, up into the top here, which is my spray bar. And through little holes in the spray bar, the water constantly circulates down all channels. In the freeze cycle, that water builds up because it's starting to freeze on the cold surface. Once, def once the harvest cycle hits, we send hot gas through here, that ice breaks loose, and will be washed off in the water. At the bottom of this, there's a strainer. Down here, there's a strainer that it captures the cubes and 
lets it go into the bin while the water continues through into the reservoir that's at the bottom of the whole thing. So again, we have our, this is showing how the harvest cycle works. We put hot gas, but we start, we keep the water going. Okay, the hot gas falls off by gravity. Okay, Scotsman does things a little bit different. Okay, the plates in a Scotsman machine are a lot of times horizontal. The spray bar sprays up into a little cup, okay? That cup is the evaporator because the evaporator coils are connected directly to it. So the impurities do not stay. They're heavier. They'll fall out and back into the, into the reservoir. So during the freeze cycle, this evaporator bar sprays up. So purity and clarity qualities are achieved by the continuous pumping of water over the face of the evaporator. This prevents air and other impurities from forming in the ice, unlike the home ice cubes, which are often cloudy and have air in them. Ice machines have several major components. You have a water circuit, you have an electrical circuit, and you have a refrigeration circuit. This is an example of what we mean by cloudy ice. Okay, we have, a, again, we look at all three components here, okay? I have my water circuit, which is the pump, the inlet valve, all the tubing, okay? Then I have my refrigeration circuit, which is the evaporator coils. We have a compressor in the back here, okay? And then I have my electrical circuit, which is the control boards, all the electrical wiring and everything else. The ice machine, the cuber water circuit, all cubers circulate water over the evaporator. The temperature of the evaporator is below freezing. Water turns to ice and remains on the evaporator surface. The remaining water falls back into the sump and is recirculated. Water pumps run constantly. Food grade plastic tubing carries the from the water from the pump to a spray tube, which sprays water over the evaporator surface. This means that the distributing of water over the entire evaporator face by stationary spray bar, sometimes an oscillating spray bar, rotating or agitating bar, or small diameter holes. Most of the time we use a stationary spray bar with small diameter holes at the top. So the types of harvest could be electric, most often seen in residential ice machines, hot gas, that's most often seen in uh, commercial, or a warm bath, which I haven't seen in years. I think that may actually be gone. Defrost initiation, which is harvest initiation, that should say, could be done by pressure, could be done by temperature, and could be done by a switching arrangement, Okay, which could be a probe or a timer. Okay, so a Scotsman harvest cycle, okay, we use hot gas, okay, and that hot gas starts warming these little um, cups up, and the ice just falls out of it by gravity. Most cubers, upon completion of the cycle, drain off the remaining water in what we call a waste or drain cycle. The remaining water has a lot of impurities like the minerals. Once that's drained, new water replaces it. If not, mineral content would build up. A use of an inlet water filter system is highly recommended. Now, just a side note on this. If you do not have a good drain, okay, you will find that people will have water all over floors and stuff like that. It will almost look like it's leaking. But check that drain line and make sure that the drain actually works and is drained to an appropriate spot. So you'll see a lot of times a triple water filter system that's put in line with the ice machine because we don't want to pull dirt in, we don't want to pull chlorine in, and we want to try to kill odors. And it's very important that these filters do not get clogged up because, again, the size of the ice cube is based on the water supply and the water temperature. 
So the refrigeration circuit in ice machines is the same as most refrigeration circuits. The major difference is the shape of the evaporator, which determines cube shape. Evaporator types could be flat plate, upside down cube, cylinder. Okay, it uses a standard low temperature condensing unit. The metering device could be TXV, cap tube, or AEV. Refrigerant in the years past, and you may still come across ice machines that use them, is R12 and 502. But today, most often, you're starting to see many other types of refrigerant. One I'm seeing very frequently is um, 134A. When setting TXB superheat, you have to wait until the ice has formed. Okay, superheat is going to be very low, 2 to 4 degrees. Condensers are usually forced draft or water cooled. So again, a water in the if you take a look in here, this is a 2200 pound per day machine, a water reservoir or float mechanism, incoming water line in the water pump. Here's the float mechanism. Okay, incoming water line comes into the float. You have your pump, you have the outlet of the pump, and you have the reservoir down here in the center. Most of the machines now use microprocessor-based controls. Be very careful about these controls. On the left here, okay, specifically, they could be direct current. So check with your meter before you assume anything. Over here on the right, we have a start component and a capacitor in here. So again, be careful as you're doing your ohm readings. Realize we have a start cap in here. So the water dump actually works by basically a valve opens, the pump still is running, but the water gets diverted out the pump valve because the water will take the path of least resistance. And as long as the water dump valve is lower to the drain than the evaporator panels, the water will run out of the dump valve. In a flake cylinder, Okay, for flakers, there's an auger in the center. You have your suction line. You have insulation around the entire evaporator part, which is a cylinder. The refrigerant flows around the outside of the cylinder, make, removing heat and making that cylinder cold, down to usually down to 20 degrees. These are usually pretty low temperature. And the auger has cutting edges on it that will shave the ice as it builds up off of that um, evaporator outside. Now, one thing, if you ever get there and the auger's not running and there's ice buildup on this, before you replace that auger motor or repair whatever component is bad, you have to defrost and get the ice off of this. If that auger stuck, you can actually burn out a new motor or kill the gears. Harvest gas, hot gas solenoid is just like any other hot gas solenoid. Two line, two power, L1 and neutral, or L1, L2 come into it. Okay, it's a mechanical electrical part. The top of this, which is the coil, can be replaced without recovering refrigerant. It's two separate parts. It's very rare for the mechanical side of this to fail. Nine out of ten times it will be the electrical side of it that fails. Okay, the discharge line thermistor monitors the discharge temperature. Okay, that will actually, believe it or not, let us know when enough ice has built up on top of here. Okay, there's little weep holes in the back, okay, to allow water to run behind the cube as this starts going into harvest mode. Because there's a little shaving of ice that will melt when that hot gas gets in here. But those weep holes, believe it or not, allow enough water to pass through that it will actually help push the ice off and allow the ice to fall off in the harvest cycle. To establish ice making needs, most manufacturers' websites have a calculator. However, if you cannot you find a calculator, use the following formulas. In a restaurant or bar or other facility like that, count all chairs, booths, and bar stools. Multiply that count by each meal served. In other words, if the facility serves breakfast, lunch, and dinner, it's three. So you take the total, 
okay, and you take that three minutes served, multiply it by 1.5, because we count on 1.5 pounds of ice per person, which is 4.5. Multiply 4.5 times the seat count. In other words, if there's 75 seats, you take 4.5 times 75, which is 337.5. Okay, so for this facility, we need 337.5 pounds of ice per day. You want to select a machine whose capacity closely matches that requirement. Ice machines are designed in even increments, so a 350 pound per 24 hour machine would be selected. The oversize will help a little bit if the calculations are close, so you don't want to go under. The other thing you want to do is if by chance this is like a seafood restaurant or someone that uses fresh ice to store product, you definitely want to go a little bit higher than that because they're going to use more ice. Production capacity is affected by inlet water temperature, ambient air temperature. To improve production, some contractors will place a 25-foot roll of copper soft tubing inside a walk-in cooler to pre-cool the water. This is only if the ice machine is close to the cooler. It doesn't work if it's 50 feet away. But a lot of times you're lucky enough and the ice machine sits next to the cooler. You can put a 25-foot roll of pre-cool copper in there. You can also use a remote condenser type machine. In other words, get the condenser out of the kitchen or the building and put it on the roof or behind the building. Okay, that will actually help with the ambient air. But that isn't used as often. Most often, the water temperatures are close enough to specs that you have decent capacity according to what the machine says. Don't undersize an ice machine. Okay, it's better to be a little bit oversized.